Hello again and welcome to the Gospel of Luke, episode 23 of 26. It's been our privilege to be with you each week, breaking open chapter and verse of this wonderful Gospel. And today we're going to be continuing our study of the Passion. We have our two guests, one of them always here, Dr. Robert Maldonado, the um, philosophy department at California State University, Fresno, for the past 23 years, and for 10 years here at KNXT, sharing his scriptural commitments and expertise. Also joining us is Father David Norris, our sacramental priest at the St. Paul Catholic Newman Center, and also the director of chaplaincy for the Diocese of Fresno, also a scholar in these gospels pursuits and a homilist par excellence in our diocese. I wonder if we could turn to Jesus taken captive and continue our line by line look at what is happening in Luke's understanding of the passion of Jesus. Robert, I think you're up. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came and the one called Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. One thing we've been noticing is the difference between Mark from last year and Luke this year. Is there anything in particular, Robert, you want to start opening up for us about where Luke's going with this narrative? Well, I think one of, the, one of the really interesting things in this passage, among many, is, the, is the, probably the most famous piece, which is the kiss. Uh, Luke actually does a really interesting thing that, uh, where uh, Mark has Judas actually kiss Jesus. Uh, Luke has Jesus stop uh, Judas from kissing him and heads him off. So he actually doesn't ever kiss him in this narrative. He just approaches him. What might be the point of that variance with Mark? Is there anything purposeful? Well, I think it's, it's the setup of the, the, the very next passage, which, which is the continuing of this theme of violence in the gospel and Jesus' commitment against that. And, and so by, by staving off Judas, that allows the disciples around him to see, oh, something more is going on. Whereas in the other gospels, in Matthew and and Mark, it, it's, it's before, you know, it's after the kiss that that becomes more clear. And, and so uh, that gives the opportunity for the disciples to say, say, shall we do this sword thing? And of course, we've seen in the past episodes that Jesus has been trying to get the disciples to see that that's not the way. Uh, and that's also related to Luke's, Luke's purpose here, because one of the things Luke is doing is, is presenting his gospel to a Roman audience. And of course, one of the problems he has to overcome is uh, Rome executed Jesus as a, you know, a, sed uh, a seditious person. And, and so uh, Luke wants to make sure that Rome understands that that was a mistake on Rome's part <laughs> and that, uh, and that the, this, this sort of um, religion that, that started with its leader being executed by Rome uh, is not the threat that Rome, at least Pontius Pilate, initially saw it to be. Father David, is there anything in that passage that you would like to mention? Maybe something when you homilize, where you go with anything there or not? Well, I, I think the, one of the clear elements in there, and I, I like what Robert said about that uh, idea of Jesus himself being innocent, and yeah. of course the, uh, the Christian community is not uh, interested in temporal political overthrow and power and so on. But I, I always like that touch with the, the healing rather mm. than the sword. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very powerful image that uh, Christ is not one who subjects others to violence, even to pr protect himself, you know, that he is a very, uh, very conscious uh, of that. And so that, that whole idea of the um, keeping the sword in its scabbard and putting, and then healing with the, yeah. the person that was, was cut by the sword. So I. Always so Lucan, yes. so sweet. Yes. Uh, one line that is kind of sharp 
in Luke is his critique of um, established uh, Judaism. And, and we're finding it over and over. He's digging in. And here's one line that's only his, and maybe we want to say, why does he keep making this point? Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come to him. He makes that point, Robert. What's the big deal here? Well, it's, it's complicated because uh, the, Jesus' critique here is difficult to really tease out the layers. That The temple police uh, were, were part of the temple establishment, and, and because uh, Israel had suffered under first Syrian and then Roman oppression, Rome and Syria took it upon themselves to appoint and depose high priests, which made it impossible for uh, even you know, generous, good priests who want to serve. Uh, they, they had limits because if they went too far against Rome in favor of the people, they would be kicked out. And, and so the one consequence of that is that the temple establishment did have some tendency to be a little more economically advantaged and a little bit more collaborating. Uh, with with Rome, and so the critique is not clear here. You know, is it is it that uh, sort of uh, resistance to that you know kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the emperor, uh, and and uh, or is it more? And I'm not sure. In that case, Father David, I think you could share with us the next passage, uh, 54 to um, to 62. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the cock crows, Today you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. You must have preached, Father David, on this I don't know how many times. What is one element here that you might like to share with us? Well, Peter, of course, is, is uh, depicted throughout the Gospels, all of the Gospels, as being very sure of himself until he you know, falls into the drink or until <laughs> something else happens. And he was, of course, he had protested uh, cons at con some length that he would never deny, even though everybody else denies and so on. Uh, so the humanity of Peter, I think, is, uh, is one thing that uh, gives us encouragement because despite his own failings, uh, the Lord loves him and uh, Jesus continues to choose him to, you know, for special office, for special ministry. But it's a, an office and a ministry that uh, Peter has to come to realize, and he does certainly eventually, uh, that's dependent upon the Lord. It's not dependent upon his own uh, power, strength, grace, good intentions, and so on. So I, I think the very humanity of Peter, as all of the characters in, this, uh, in the Passion narrative, uh, are very, uh, they're very human beings, and we can identify with parts of these characters in ourselves if we're really paying attention to it. Anything else there, Robert, especially about the way that Luke has edited this little passage also? Well, the, the weeping, I think, is, is unique to Luke and, and underscores what Father David was saying, that there's that change. I, always, I also, I don't know if this is particularly Lucan, but I always find it interesting just to think about the, uh, then he remembered. And, and so that, the, you know, as, as Father David said, the warning was there, but somehow it's, I don't know, for me too, it's difficult to keep mindful of what you've been told. <laughs> and, and so uh, I, just, I just find that line really kind of comforting <laughs> uh, that, that it's... The two lines I find kind of very cogent right here, added by Luke, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That's not in the other narrative, so Luke wants it that 
Jesus looks at Peter. And then that Peter cries bitterly. Everyone else has him crying, but Luke wants to upgrade it a bit. He's, he's bitterly crying. On that note, Robert, can you walk us through the next passage to get us to the half of the show? Um, this next little episode, please. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to the council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then he said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. What's most important there, Robert? Well, it's, it, again, it's, it's difficult to tease out the layers here because in the, the trial scene here, uh, in the time of Jesus, even to identify oneself or someone else as the Son of God was not actually necessarily fighting words or reasons to kick people out. Uh, the Son of God was a title for king, and, and so it could be political religious more than simply uh, uh, theological religious or something. Uh, and, and so uh, what I think is going on here is really pretty interesting in Luke because Luke is setting up all these characters that are sort of denying Jesus, mocking Jesus, uh, participating in his crucifixion. And just kind of like Peter, there's a, a, a variety of threefold uh, versions of this. And then Pilate does it too, as we'll see. And so uh, it's, it's almost as if Luke is setting up everybody as kind of fallen short. Uh, but therefore also everybody is redeemable by the grace of God. And, and so this, this language in this passage here I think really reflects a much later time, Luke's time, where there's a, a little more strong competition between the non-Christian Jewish community uh, around Luke and, and the Christian community. And those, both of those groups are struggling to figure out what their identity is after the destruction of the temple and, and the aftermath of the Jewish war. Father David, before we take the break, is there something in this passage or anything that's led up to it that you'd like to um, share with us now? Well, this contrast uh, where the crowd asks him, uh, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And uh, it's it, they're doing it in a way of blaspheming, but Jesus says uh, elsewhere all that's going to happen. He was indeed the prophet. He was the, the one who knew what was going to be going sure. on as he followed God's will even though they give that to him as kind of an insult, uh, it's really recognizing what his real role is as the one who speaks on behalf of God as a prophet and had already warned what was going to be happening here. And sure enough, it's, it's coming, coming true. Luke and irony is um, raising its head here. It's, he is a prophet, but they're mocking him, prophesy. It's gonna come up again with some more incidents coming up in the Passion, so stay tuned. We'll take our one minute break now, but don't go anywhere because we still have a lot more to share when we come back. Stay tuned. For over 25 years, KNXT has been serving the people of the San Joaquin Valley with good family television. That's just not available anywhere else. It's important for you, the viewer, to help support this valuable tool of ministry. KNXT needs to continue to grow and bring you important programming about your faith. But sometimes it's hard to stop and find the time. Make it easy. Go to knxt.tv and find out how easy it is to support your Catholic television station, KNXT TV. Hello again and welcome to the second half of our 23rd program on the Gospel of Luke. Believe it or not, we're starting the 23rd chapter. We're in the Passion Narrative and Father David is going to walk us through the trial before Pilate. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him saying, We found this man perverting our nation 
forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching them throughout all Judea from Galilee, where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. So much of that text that Father David just read is Luke. It's special stuff that Luke really liked. Father David, what part of it do you want to crack open for us? Well, I think this, the accusations of the, uh, of the chief priests and the crowds uh, keep getting uh, rejected by Pilate. You know, Pilate uh, has a very insistent word that I find nothing, uh, nothing guilty. I find nothing wrong with what he's done. I don't find anything. Um, uh, and then the, we bring this character Herod, and every time I read this yeah. passage, I think of the song in uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> exactly. I believe it is, where he comes before Herod, and uh, Herod is, uh, wants to see him uh, perform some sign, and that this isn't a sign in the way that maybe John's Gospel would use it as an indication of faith or leading to faith. This is kind of, let's do a trick or do some kind of bit of magic for me, you know, and Jesus' response, he's, he's much more responsive to Pilate, the Roman governor, than he is to the so-called king, Herod. You know, he makes no answer. He doesn't respond uh, in any way to that, that kind of uh, uh, lack of faith and lack of, of even really asking serious questions. What else, Robert? There's so much in the Passion narrative. What else would you like to share? Well, there's, there's several things in, in this. Uh, I think that statement about him not responding to Herod is really important because of the contrast. Uh, and the ironic statement at the end with uh, the two of these characters, Herod and Pilate, becoming friends. And, and I'm never quite sure whether that's sincere on Luke's part or ironic because obviously they're participating in the death. Uh, but Luke is also doing some work to kind of rehabilitate Pilate because everything we know about Pilate in every other historical context is that he was a horrifically awful human being and and he would have cared less about any sort of internal theological squabbles among the Jews uh, and that actually comes out kind of clearly in here he, he initially has some interest in King uh, because that could be a political threat to Rome and then he gets really interested in the Galilean uh, and that's when he sends him to Herod. And of course, Herod is over the Galilee as a, as a tetrarch, I think. But, uh, but the point is that Galilee was a hotbed of revolution. And so the fact that Jesus was now identified as coming from Galilee, the fact that he had a popular following, was probably enough for Pilate to uh, take this a little bit more, uh, a little bit more seriously. Uh, and so uh, it's... it's uh, it's a really interesting passage. The, the last thing I would say here too is that the, you know, the, this refrain that Jesus said, similar with the chief priests, are you the son of God? You say that I am. Pilate says, are you the king? Uh, he, and Jesus responds, you say so. Uh, both of those phrases are very difficult to interpret because in Greek they don't mark questions or declarative statements very often. And so it could be, do you say so? <laughs> you said it. <laughs> or you say so. <laughs> and, and so any of those are possible, uh, possible options. And obviously it makes a difference too how you, how you read those. I think you're learning, hopefully all of us are learning as we crack open verse by verse, the depth of the narrative, the difficulty of comprehending it in its fullness. 
I want to offer one last thought here on this passage, kind of um, maybe ironic, maybe just Luke really wanting to dig in one more time, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor. Well, a couple chapters ago, we saw point blank that he didn't do that. So it's not even that the complaint has any validity so that he is really putting a straw person up knocking down Jesus uh, with complaints and uh, statements of crimes for which he wasn't even guilty even of doing what they said he did because he didn't. The innocence of Jesus comes out so clearly in Luke's narrative, um, he's really giving the Romans a break here that um, you were badgered into this thing, but you didn't want to do it. And poor Rome, bad other people. And it's um, kind of important to see that edge, huh? I mean, it's like we've got to recognize that negative presentation of Judaism in front of us in the gospel. And the, and the rehabilitation of Pilate. Oh, yeah. Um. That would leave us, Robert, the last passage for today, I think it is. Can you um, walk us through that more about our friend Pilate? Yeah. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted together, Away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. And a third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. So much to mine here. Where would you like to start, Robert? Well, again, I mentioned earlier, there's that threefold sort of questioning, which I think kind of mirrors in a sort of weird uh, inverse the threefold denial of Peter, uh, so that it's, it's again trying to sort of affirm Pilate's protest, protesting that Jesus is innocent and therefore in emphasizing the innocence, uh, but also lifting, lifting Pilate uh, in this moment higher than Peter uh, because he's doing a threefold sort of affirmation of Christ in the face of the crowd. Uh, but it's also, you know, he's still willing to flog Jesus and he, he also shows a sort of weakness of character, I suppose, in that he just gives into the, into the demands of the crowds. Uh, it's, uh, the crowds don't threaten him the way they do in the other Gospels in Mark. You know, you are no friend of Caesar's, uh, which could be a very serious problem if that gets back to Caesar. And, and, and none, of that, none of that is here. Father David, um, Good Friday, we'll read, uh, well, we read John actually on Good Friday, but during Holy Week, this gospel mm -hmm. is in front of us. When you preach, what parts of this text do you ever deal with? Well, there's definitely that whole element of the irony that keeps coming up in the, in the very fact that uh, First of all, the people that are accusing Jesus are not actually accusing him with the truth. They're not telling the truth about what uh, he is supposedly guilty of. And then the irony is that someone who has been convicted of, uh, of insurrection and murder, because he's already serving time for that, uh, he's going to be released. And the one who is innocent is going to be condemned. Uh, that, uh, it, it's, um, it comes out very clearly that uh, these uh, folks are so bent on their own will and their own wishes that they are completely blinded to the truth, the, the truth that is standing before them, uh, because they've really shut out, they've closed themselves off from that. So it's a, it's a, a tragic, it's a tragedy in a classic sense, but it's even more of a tragedy when we think of it 
that as often has been pointed out in these, in these programs, these um, lines are addressed to us as well. It's not only the crowds there and the, that church, but it's the church today and the, the world today. I'm glad Father David mentioned that as we're reading texts that have been used over and over to, um, which end up in the Holocaust, texts that are just awful when they are preached badly. I want to thank Father David for reminding us this is for us now the text we, we are left with, but it also is calling us to look at how we follow Jesus and do we accept or do we reject. So in other words, let's see this for ourselves. One line I want to ask, I think Robert will tell us why it's in or out. There's a certain verse 17, theoretically, and it goes something like this. Now he was obliged to release one man for them at the festival. I've seen it written as this could be in, this could be out. It wasn't included in the uh, New Revised Standard Version. What about that, Robert, when there's certain lines that some text will want and others will exclude in a reading? Well, it's, a, it's a, uh, a very difficult discipline called text criticism because, as you probably know, there are many, 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 many manuscripts of the Bible. None of them are original autographs, and, so, and, and they don't all agree with each other. And so the, the task that scholars take upon themselves, and I'm not one of them, it's, it's quite a, a, a difficult uh, discipline to master. Uh, but you have to comb these, you, you learn different uh, motifs, even different scribal habits to try to, to, to figure out, given all these different manuscripts, what is most likely and reasonably the original or closest to the original that we can get. Uh, and, and so that's an example of that. Uh, I actually wanted to make one point about the, a, a really great theological moment here, and that is Lucan and, and it's, uh, even though Barabbas is in other Gospels, uh, Luke does a very particular thing because all the way back in chapter 4, Luke set up Jesus' ministry with an inaugural address at the synagogue where he said, today the Spirit is upon me, I proclaim the good news, the blind will see, the lame will walk, the prisoner will be set free. Ah. And this is the first place in the narrative when a prisoner gets set free. And I think it really is, even though Luke doesn't seem to have much in common with Paul, uh, in spite of the tradition of their association, uh, at this point he might actually have it because it's kind of a little bit of the, uh, the innocent is graciously saved by God. I want to thank David and Robert for today's show. We'll be back again next week. Till then, God bless.